is risen. You may be seated. Now, if you didn't know what just happened, that's one of these Lutheran things that we like to do, Uh, not only so we can find each other in restaurants, but so that we can affirm the fact that this is still Easter, and we're still celebrating the fact that Christ is risen, and that makes all the difference for who we are. So, uh, when you hear us say, Alleluia, Christ is risen, or Christ is risen, you can respond by saying, He is risen indeed, Alleluia. So, That's one of those little things that we like to do here. Uh, It is Easter. We're going to continue to celebrate Easter, but it's also a very special day. It is Mother's Day. So moms, happy Mother's Day. But realize if it wasn't for us dads, you wouldn't be mothers. (laughs) See you later. I'm out of here for today. (laughs) No, it's been a really funny morning. Um, If it was a dad's day, that'd be funny. I think it always is dad's day. I was talking to my dad this morning, and I told him, I was like, I'm wearing my Easter shirt. He's like, you know, when I watched the video from Easter, that actually reminded me, that shirt looks like a shirt that my mother would have worn. (laughs) I know, and the sad thing is, I think he's right. Like, she loved flower prints, and and so, yeah, same thing, which is is good. But that's all right. We're here. We're excited to celebrate Mother's Day. Uh, The 8 o'clock service was a pretty funny little event. Um, As the kids were, my kids were up here doing the the whole uh, children's message, and... Uh, Mary's like, do you know what day is today? And my kids are like, Easter. And I was like, 10 points. Love it. (laughs) But then it took like a solid five minutes for them to figure out that it was Mother's Day. Uh, So apparently, I did not do a great job so far on the Mother's Day thing. I woke her up at 5.30 when I was leaving to say happy Mother's Day. That's love. (laughs) But if you could help me wish Brittany a happy Mother's Day because we're working today, I would greatly appreciate that. And maybe it'll earn me some points. So happy Mother's Day. I'm going to need a place to stay tonight. <laughs> Thanks, John. There's a lot of things going on here at St. Luke's that we're really excited about. I don't know. The color of the sheet today is kind of an orange color. Um, so anyway, things that are going on this week that I need to point out. Um, next Sunday, May 19th, we are going to be having a congregational meeting. We have congregational meetings, uh, a minimum of twice a year as determined by our bylaws. And at this meeting, we're going to be going over who we're going to try to elect for new council uh, positions. So we need to vote that in. We're also going to be going over some budgetary things and some vision and goals things. So things for the whole congregation to participate in, give voice to, and support for. So uh, please come. We're going to be having that congregational meeting at noon. So right after the 11 o'clock service. So you can leave the service, go down, have some fellowship time, do your thing, then come back and we'll have that. Uh, It'll probably take around an hour or less, give or take, depending on what questions come up. 
So that should be uh, a good opportunity to support the ministry that's happening here and to get involved at that high, high level. So that's big. Um, also, on May 18th, we're going to be having our volunteer appreciation event. Every year we kind of do this to thank you guys, to come together, to have some fun for volunteering, for giving of your gifts, your time, your talents, your abilities. So please, out in the narthex, sign up to come because Mary's going to be cooking and we need a head count. That way we have enough food for everybody. But we're going to be doing a night at the Oscar. So you can dress up. We're going to have a lot of fun. There's going to be the picture things going on. We're going to be giving out awards, funny little awards. The whole thing is we're just going to have fun for like an hour and a half or two hours. We're just going to get together, laugh, fellowship, have some fun, celebrate the year of uh, ministry seasons coming to a close and look towards next year. So we're going to be having some good times and there's going to be awards and then I think there's going to be Mad Libs, right? If they get done this week? Okay, cool. Uh, so you get up and give a little speech, but you'll be able to just put in the information. It's, it's going to be hilarious. I'm really excited about it. So make sure you come out for that. Uh, we'd love to have you all there. Um, the other thing is that I forget, oh yeah, the church camp out. Uh, if you haven't signed up for the church camp out, August 8th through 11th, I know you don't want to be thinking about the end of your summer because it's not even here yet, but please think about it. Sign up out there. We go over to uh, Sugar Pine Point campsite. It's not a point. State Park, okay, it's great. Sign up for the camp out. It's right out there. You can figure out where it's at by the end of the summer. Um, but it's $110 for Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. We leave Sunday morning. We have a service Saturday night. So if you don't like to camp, you can come up for the service and for the uh, potluck that we have together. It's a great time. And if you have friends that you would like to invite along with you, just put their name down also right below yours and attach an arrow together that you're supposed to be in spots next to each other. And I'll make sure that you guys get in a spot uh, where you can hang out together because it's not fun to invite people to the camp out and then put them across the way from anybody that they might actually know or recognize. So we'll get you together and it'll be great. So who's going to the camp out so far? Who is going to sign up today? That's what I thought. But please do. Uh, St. Luke's Roots, if you're looking to become a new member at the church, is on June 1st. So that's also at the sign-up. If you don't know where the sign-ups are, in the narthex, right by the doors going out of the building, there's a bulletin board that has all the different sign-ups for all the different things. That's where we're going to go over Lutheran theology and how that impacts uh, our vision and mission here at St. Luke's. Otherwise, you can see all the other things going on right here. I'm going to set those things aside because I'm going to invite you to stand up, shake some hands, share the peace of the Lord. You can say, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. And and find out who doesn't know how to say it yet. All right, you can find your seats. After service, we have muffins with mom, so you can go over there and grab pictures and have a muffin and fellowship and talk some more. But I want to give a special welcome, since it is Mother's Day, to those who gave birth this year to their first child. You can stay standing. We're going to start the service here real quick. We celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate your service. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this harder than it is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. 
To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we pray and wait for God's will with you. To those whose step-parent, we walk with you on this complex path. To those who envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, we pray with you. To those who will have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who place children up for adoption and those who have adopted, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart. and We have real warriors in our midst. Moms, we love you. Morning. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for all of that which we just said. We praise you for every single woman in this room. And Lord, we thank you for for the ultimate love that you've shown us through the cross, through sacrificing your one and only son. That would be so hard to do. And I'm so thankful that it was you and not me because I couldn't do it. We praise your name this morning, Lord. Amen.
we've joined together in confessing the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, who was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, who was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. You may be seated. And kids, honest, we can, I know it's one more song. It's 9.51. I'm sorry, they're leaving. Odyssey kids, you can go.
That you dare to dream uh, really uh, do come true. Amen. So, uh, after Easter, we've been going through this sermon series called Life with Purpose. We're kind of looking at how Dorothy's life changed so much. It went technicolor, you might say, as she entered into uh, the land of Oz. And all of a sudden, she had vision, purpose, and she realized that she had s- some really deep needs And ultimately, we in this Easter, as everything's changed in the hope of the resurrection, we too realize we have deep needs. So the first week, we looked at Dorothy's experience, uh, if I only had a way home. And we looked at those slippers and were reminded that those slippers she got at the very beginning of the story, and they were with her the whole time, bringing her home kind of like Jesus. Um, Then we went to the scarecrow, if I only had a brain, and God produces wisdom. This morning, we're going to look at if I only had a heart, the tin man. The Tin Man is an interesting character. Uh, He's really concerned about uh, rusting. Um, If you know anything about metals, um, tin doesn't rust. Um, If you're thinking like tin roof, then you're thinking the uh, galvanized or the, the steel that's underneath it with the iron in it, and then the tin is on top of it, and then if it gets worn off, then yeah, you get rust, oxidization, and things like that. But um, somebody did point out, though, maybe he was concerned about the bolts. There is a there is a fan theory out there. I know we love fan theories today. Uh, that it was his bolts that were made out of iron, and therefore he was worried about his bolts rusting or the hinges. I mean, there's all kinds of goofy stuff. But yeah, he was a little concerned uh, about this whole rusting thing, and that didn't even seem to be his problem. I thought there might be a sermon in there, because it seems like there is a lot of times where we have uh, worries and fears in our lives that aren't very realistic, and yet they are immobilizing. But I'm going to set that aside, because we're doing love today. So anyway, I wanted to bring you first to uh, the the letter that John, the Gospel of John, the apostle, the disciple John, he's the youngest disciple, uh, writes because he receives a revelation from Jesus in 90 AD. So this is a long time after Jesus has ascended and the other disciples have all died. And so we're leaving what's called the apostolic age, where it's the age of the church with no people uh, who were actually present disciples of Jesus. He's the last one. And God sends Jesus specifically sends a revelation and and shows John some things that need to be given to the churches. So in this revelation, uh, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, there are seven letters that Jesus gives to John to give to the churches of the dispersion. So the churches, these faith communities that are all spread out over the Greco-Roman world, uh, but they're these little faith communities, uh, God gives these seven letters to these seven churches. Um, What's interesting about this, though, is that these letters didn't go out to each church individually. The collection of letters in the whole revelation were sent to all of the churches. It was meant to give the churches each one encouragement from each one's experience. So the church in Ephesus, which we're going to look at, they got one, Laodicea, uh, Philippi. I mean, they went all over the place. But each church got to read what was going on, the strengths and the challenges that each faith community was experiencing at the time that Jesus wanted to communicate and build up. It was this idea that faith communities are called to walk together. Anybody know a word for walking together in faith community? It's called synod. And St. Luke's is part of the Lutheran Church, Missouri, synod, which is this idea that we are called in faith communities to walk together, to be strengthened by each other's strengths, and to build up each other in our weaknesses, and to continue on in this faith journey together. Kind of a cool thing. So anyway, Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, we have this first church to the church in Ephesus. To the angel in the church of Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. That's Jesus. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. That's some pretty big encouraging words for a faith community. 
You endure, you suffer, you work hard according to the law of God to live a godly and a righteous life. To have that kind of obedience as part of your community, that's a good thing. And then you notice he goes further, he says, you always ask the question from each leader who comes in, each person claiming to be an apostle and asking, what is their doctrine, what are they teaching, and how does that line up from the things that we've already learned and know? Now, you might not know the word doctrine. Doctrine are the teachings that come from theology. You've probably heard of the word theology before. It's like anything else with an ology, but theo is the study of God. So from the study of God, from considering who God is, we get these things, these teachings called doctrine. And that's what kind of characterizes our beliefs as a faith community. So the church in Ephesus is looking and saying, hmm, how do these new teachings line up with what we already know and believe about who God is and how he works in this world? And when they're wrong, they declare it as such and then push it out. We're not going to have that as part of who we are. We're not going to let that kind of falsehood and those lies take our pure and good doctrine and and ruin it and soil it. And then the last thing he said was, Uh, You also seem to bear with each other patiently, that you hold each other up and endure with one another. You're self-preserving. You look after and take care of one another. Those are three wonderfully good characteristics of any community. We would be blessed, and I think we are blessed here at St. Luke's, to be able to say, yeah, those are things that we value and are part of who we are, at least most of the time. We can take a lot of confidence in those things. And then he goes on to verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I learned it when I memorized it in the NIV 84, and it just stuck with me. Remember the height from which you have fallen. This idea of, oh, do you remember the joy and the hope The mercy, the grace that came with that love that you knew at first. And that's a question that I think every faith community, every one of us who are followers of Jesus should be asking ourselves on a daily basis. What comes first? I've got the doctrine. I've got the care for my brothers and sisters in the community. I desire to live a godly life. But have I set aside the love of God in Christ Jesus. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3 kind of draws that up into great detail and question because, yes, self-preservation is good, pure doctrine is good, godly living is good, but Paul brings this up in his wonderful phrasing in 1 Corinthians 13. If you've ever been to a wedding, you've probably heard it beginning in verse 4, love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, da-da-da-da-da, which I'm going to get to, so I'll dot off for now. But it starts the chapter with this, these three statements. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. That's a big statement. If I, if I speak in the tongues of angels and men, when I was in college with my interpersonal communication degree, uh, I, I took a class called Gender Issues and Communications. I thought maybe I would learn how to talk to girls better. <laughs> it was me and a whole bunch of girls in the class. It didn't work out. But could you imagine the ability to not only communicate effectively with all of humanity, to be able to communicate your experience and so that somebody else would receive it, not only them, but angels. And he says, even if I could do all of that but have not love, I'm just noise. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. It doesn't matter how big your faith community is, how, how everybody looks at you and thinks you're wise or you're learned or you're eloquent or you're lovable. I mean, all those kind of things, all that stuff is irrelevant. And even if it's right, he's not saying like just misunderstood. He's saying you actually have these things. You understand all these things. People flock to you, to your community to try to learn and to grow. But if you don't have love, you're nothing. Nothing. And if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. 
godly living, pure doctrine, and care for each other, self-preservation. Without love, we have nothing. So to avert our eyes for just a moment from the love of God in Christ Jesus, to distract our attention for just an instance, to put precedence on any one of these other things before the love of God is to lose it all. Because love is foregoing. Love is preeminent in everything that we are. Colossians chapter 3. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. All good things. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on, I don't think you all believed it, put on, yeah, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Love is preeminent, and it is the beginning of what it is to be faith community. Without it, we cannot do it. We cannot forgive. We cannot be patient. We cannot encourage and build each other up. There is no pure doctrine without love. And love equips us for everything that we are. It, of course, is the gospel of God. The gospel is the good news in Christ Jesus that he would send his son to die on the cross to redeem his people, that we would have life in his name. But it's also the giving of the law. Moms, I know sometimes our children get this idea that when we're punishing them for stepping out of line with rules or when we give them rules and responsibilities in the house, they think that we don't love them. But that's love, right? Because we desire for them what's best for their life and healthy for their living and their development. Jesus was dealing with this uh, in Matthew when some Pharisees were confusing with some Sadducees. They brought in a lawyer because that always makes things better. And they asked him a question from Matthew 22. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his doctrine, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. Which means we can take 37 books and shrink it into two statements. Love God. Love each other. This is the law and the prophets. This is what God has given us to be able to live in relationship with one another, to be able to forgive, to bear one another's burdens, to live in peace and kindness and generosity with one another. Love is what holds us and gives us the hope in the future, knowing that today might be filled with sin, the grave and death and heartache, but tomorrow there's coming something where tears are wiped from our eyes. So, The question is, what is this love? (laughs) That song, what is love, just hit my head. So sermon's over. Baby, don't hurt me. What what is love? (sighs) Better just stop saying it. Well, you you know two verses. You probably know this one verse in the Bible, John 3.16. Have you ever heard that one before? There's another one that the same guy wrote in his first letter, epistle, 1 John 3.16. They go very nicely together. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, that we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. In John 3.16, if you know it, let's read it together. Actually, you can just read it, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In faith by the Holy Spirit, we are shown what love is because God would send his only son to die on the cross, that we would have life in his name, that we would be made whole, that we would have the Holy Spirit to live under the law and to continue to hold us faithfully in the gospel until his coming again. He shows us that love is not measured in desire. It's measured in faithful suffering. Endure.
endurance. Because we learn that love is actually what gives power and motivation to grace. Grace is God's free will, his disposition of just joy and love and affection over us, even though we don't deserve it. And that grace is what motivates faith, which brings us into relationship with him. Love is all of that. Which tells us that love does not shy away from the cost of sin. It doesn't have to turn its back and run at the sight and the fear of death in the grave. Love is able to suffer and endure all things, not because of desire, but because we know one who has suffered on our behalf, and he has opened the way from death and sin from the inside out. And we know that we can follow in his love because he gives us the Holy Spirit to live in his strength, in his love. You know, what's interesting is the tin man, this is his little heart, so that's nice. The tin man, uh, he didn't have a brain either. I don't know if you know that. Uh, if you read the books, you're braver than I. I wikipedia the whole thing. He didn't have a brain either, and while they were on their journeys, he and the scarecrow would have lots of discussions about which one was more important to acquire. Is it better to have a brain or to have love? That's why I love the Tin Man, because you watch the movie and the whole brain thing's not even brought up because love is so much more important. He didn't come up empty-handed. I'm going to read you the next part of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, beginning in verse 4, that the love of God might wash over you, might remind you of his steadfast faithfulness. It might continue to build you up in the hope of the gospel and make you who you are because we're called first to love. You can close your eyes, you can read along, you can just meditate. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. But love, love never ends. And the grace and the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. At this time, we'll continue with the gathering of our tithes and our offerings. And I invite you, if you're new to St. Luke's, to fill out a welcome card. Those welcome cards are there so that I can answer any questions that you might have or the staff can answer any questions that you might have and, and also help you find new ways to connect here at St. Luke's that you might be able to plug into this faith community as we journey together and look to what life with purpose means.
aspects of our lives. So I want to hone in on one because in the church um, we have this very special gift called forgiveness. And the love of God gives power to forgiveness. I want you to take just a couple minutes to do a quick inventory of names of people, things you've been harboring. Maybe it's just that person in that car who did this or did that where you have withheld forgiveness, where you've still held prejudice or frustration. To realize, and to just take a moment, to realize that withholding forgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. And to take all of that poison and to give that to Jesus. Just a second. The scriptures tell us that love covers a multitude of sin. Because the love of God was made known in Christ Jesus that 
while we were still sinners, Christ was dying for us. He was going to carry that hurt, that poison, to seek out a relationship with us and to make us whole. And for what you have been forgiven, what he carries for you, he reminds us every day that he can carry that for everyone else that we carry heartache for. That even the sin of not being able to forgive is swallowed up in the victory in Easter. And that those relationships are new in his name. Because your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we have life and community in his name.
we're going to pray together and uh, we're going to pray specifically for our moms so uh, if you see a mom around you hold her hand uh, you can put a hand on her shoulder um, but we're going to pray over moms specifically this morning so uh, you don't have to know the mom just assume that she is a mom or a female and and get close get comfortable so um, I'm going to pray for all of us. You can stand quietly. Um, but this is an ancient practice of the church. Laying on of hands constitutes the community, the body of Christ, in blessing over people. Uh, for co uh, commendation to calls, for healing, for all kinds of wonderful blessings from our Lord. So we're going to do that for the moms. I'll take ladies sharing. Come over here. You guys are too far away from sit in the front makes people uncomfortable. So I'll lay hands on you too. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for the blessing in Easter as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the love that he has shown us and how you have put that in the hearts of all of these wonderful women. How they bind together like glue the family and community. They bind up the brokenhearted. They give strength and endurance to those that they've been called to love. Lord, for those moms who are carrying children, Lord, we ask that you'd give them uh, health and safety in this process, that you'd bring those children uh, forth in, in good health. And Lord, we know that moms don't stop carrying them just because they're done at the hospital. They carry those children the rest of their lives. Lord, for all the hurt from sin and death that comes through that journey, we ask that you'd bind them up in the hope of the resurrection, that you'd remind them that this is not the end, but Christ has already established it from everlasting. Lord, for those we're not able to lay hands on today because they are now seated at your hand in glory, for those moms that we miss, Lord, we thank and praise you that you have held them through sin, death, and the grave they have realized your love and glory and that you've wiped away every tear from their eye. Lord, we thank you for their relationship and their place in our hearts. Lord, we ask that you'd continue to provide each one of these women, whether they have biological children, adopted children, spiritual children, or just love the little babies that run around this place. Lord, we ask that you'd give them strength and remind them of the blessing that they are as they love each of these children, each of us. they give in sacrifice to love and to forgive according to the work that they've shown us in Christ Jesus. In his blessed name, we ask that you bless them this day as you call us to pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's a crazy new world. I don't think Luther had to deal with this. But after the sermon, I was starting to get text messages that people appreciated the sermon and things like that on my watch. That's weird. Um, <laughs> the Lord is faithful. But the other one that I got, which I needed to let you know about, uh, was there's tons of food left over there with muffins for mom. So go, I, I'm, I have to say it very carefully because last week I accidentally said moms with muffins and then I got explained by my wife that that's not okay. <laughs> so muffins with moms is what we're celebrating. And over there you can get a picture. They have this beautiful flower thing going on and there's lots of different foods and time for fellowship. So go over and celebrate. Celebrate the love that God has given us in, in these moms and in each other and just have some, have some fellowship after service. As you go from this place, go in the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ who has loved us through sin, death, and the grave that we might have life everlasting in his name, that we would know peace and joy because of his unimaginable love for each of us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
what you've done for me. You won't keep 